welcome everyone to um, the first episode in our Industry Insights interview series. Uh, the series forms part of Novus Victoria's Gap to Grow campaign. Um, it's a campaign spanning over 12 weeks where we've taken all our um, content, events and activities online due to COVID-19 and look to continue to provide value to students, graduates and young professionals working or studying in the built environment um, during this uh, challenging um, time, but also a time that uh, presents some opportunity for us to develop both professionally and personally. Um, Novus Victoria is the young professionals arm um, of the Chartered Institute of Building. The Chartered Institute of Building is the peak, global peak body for construction with over 55,000 uh, members globally and a significant base here in Australia. My name is Fia Longmore. I'm the chair of Novus Victoria and also regional chair uh, for the Oceania region. And I'm joined by Conrad Piera, who's our vice chair. Hello. Hi, Conrad. And um, also today we're joined by Brian McAdam um, from Hanson Youngkin. Morning, Brian. Good morning, everybody. So morning. Brian's been kind enough to um, jump on board today to give us an insight into what contractors are experiencing during this time. Um, so we're fortunate to have Brian and uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing about some of the experiences that um, Hans and Youngkin have had, Brian have had and the industry more broadly have had. So Brian, I might hand over to you to give a bit of an intro to uh, yourself and the, the company you work for. Again, good morning everybody. My name is Brian McAdam. I'm the operations manager here at Hanson Youngkin uh, in here in Melbourne. Uh, Hanson Youngkin are a building company that formed 101 years ago in 1918 and has been fully operational in uh, Melbourne since then. We're in regional Victoria for 95 years and we have got nine offices from uh, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia. Uh, the business turns over roughly about $1.3 billion each year uh, out of each of those nine offices. So a, a reasonably sizable uh, building company. Uh, we specialise uh, and work a lot for in the government space, in the commercial space, and uh, we deliver hospitals, prisons, um, public buildings, office blocks, and um, other interest, big, interesting buildings. Yeah, fantastic. And, and yourself, Brian, so I understand you um, spent a number of years at GrowCon before moving to Hanson Youngkin, and you've been at Hanson Youngkin for a couple of years now? Yes, I've uh, joined Hanson Youngkin over two and a half years ago. Uh, before that, I uh, worked in the uh, GrowCon organisation for some 27 years, uh, both in New South Wales and in Victoria, starting off as a project coordinator um, and finishing up as the uh, construction manager in New South Wales and operations manager in Victoria. So, um, uh, learned a lot about the industry, migrated to Australia in 1987. So, um, have had uh, quite a run of uh, very busy periods and periods like in the early 90s where there was a significant downturn in the industry and uh, the nervousness that that uh, gave to uh, the industry as a whole, and then the downturn in 2008. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, that's interesting, and I know a lot of the media is reporting, uh, making references to 2008 and the global recession we had. Um, yep. And I guess and I guess the, the real challenge with the coronavirus and COVID-19 is that it's not just the economy, it's... Um, it's a significant health impact as well, and that's what's really, I guess, shaken the globe. It's a, um, you're getting attacked from all angles. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it, it's affecting every facet of uh, not uh, like anything that we have experienced in our lifetime before. Most of what we've experienced in the, uh, in the recent past has affected one aspect of the economy rather than the whole of uh, 
what we know as life and um, we're sort of looking as to what the new normal will be you know uh, mm -hmm. very few of us know but particularly with where we uh, are currently as a society or as an industry and what we're dealing with in our home life in our family etc uh, is something that is unprecedented. Maybe it was during the Spanish flu in the early 1900s, um, but not unlike anything that we've seen or, or uh, dealt with in our, uh, as I say, in our lifetime. That's right. And um, uh, without being too philosophical, I think it's really um, provided a reset for a lot of people. And to think about those points that you mentioned, Brian, family, health, mm -hmm. um, connectedness, mm -hmm all those sort of fundamentals of uh, being human where we're sort of we've been forced to really consider again um, and not be so caught up in the, um, the the shiny objects in the corner, so to speak. Um, on that note, yes, I might, I mean, I'll, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just going to pass to um, Conrad uh, for our first um, sort of formal question for you, Brian. Um, Conrad? Yeah, well, we've, we thought we'd kick things off today by discussing the global construction industry um, and COVID-19's impact on that, given that uh, projects are facing supply chain issues and there's a halt to planning, inspection timetables from the global sort of uh, supply chains um, and new measures for health and safety in the workplace, plus the social distancing measures that have come into place as a result of that. Um, can you expand on how Hanson Youngkin is dealing with that and what you foresee in the future that may uh, complicate things further as we gear up to go back to sort of business as usual? Yeah, it's a great question and one that we have been dealing with now for uh, a couple of months as what is the effect on each one of our 16 projects here in Victoria at this moment in time? And when you analyze where the goods are coming from, where they're manufactured, where's the factory, and what needs to happen to get them from there to here, um, we've had instances where we've got lift equipment, for instance, coming from Spain. So the Spanish industry is completely shut down. We have got uh, timber veneers being manufactured in Germany, and the factories have shut down. So, and uh, the big thing about industry is how do we react to these particular significant issues in the in the supply chain? So, if we're talking, let's say, um, about uh, Spain. Uh, for instance, that particular project we've had to go and with the client so that we both understand what the issue is. Because this particular lift has to supply DDA compliance, so uh, disability discrimination compliance to get a person with a disability between two or three levels within a building, we've had to seek dispensation uh, and the billing supplier has had to come on the journey with us. And so this particular is an instance where you can see the supply chain and the client at the end of the day or the use of the building. We all have to come together to actually work through a solution to either get the facility open or to recognize that there are certain pieces of it that don't currently or will not comply when it's finished. The issue then is when will we bring it up to speed? And that is the discussion with the building supplier. So they can issue a certificate, but it needs them to be able to work through as to when the building needs to comply. And they're the sort of things we can see now that the, that the industry in Italy is beginning to open, which will then feed into ceramic tiles and marble from the mountains in Northern Italy. Um, and then, you know, some of that um, manufactured uh, kitchen bench top stone uh, composite uh, uh, arrangements, those sort of will, will now first begin to open up the factories in northern uh, Italy. We will see then over the next couple of weeks, Spain will begin to open again in some form. Um, and so, yeah, we recognize those particular issues in the supply chain. The other aspect of the supply chain is uh, China. And because we are so influenced by the Chinese manufacturing of windows, glass, uh, ceramic tiles, uh, lift equipment, rails, uh, etc. Uh, yeah, China has a very big influence on how we think and how we operate. And um, 
Brian, whilst whilst we're on China, there's um, there's a few whispers in the in the industry that um, in an effort to um, really boost um, the economy in China, we're seeing as opposed to the anticipated increases in material um, and joinery and frame etc. costs from China, we're seeing a slight decrease in an effort by China to um, you know, uh, restart its economy and and be sort of uber competitive. Have you seen uh, it? Uh, we uh, currently most of the projects that we have are in the 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 orders were let into China some months ago. Therefore, we don't see any of that sort of commercial benefit. We were more interested in making sure that uh, the powder coating facilities the facilities uh, that extrude aluminium, manufacture glass, and then assemble the product before it gets shipped, that those particular factories opened. Uh, and it was great to see that over the last three weeks, uh, the Chinese suppliers uh, will come to our office and we will work through specific issues around their supply chain that supplies us. So if, they, if the paint shop is not open for whatever reason or they can't run the aluminium section, then it affects uh, our ability to get the product uh, to Australia. We are seeing delays, uh, don't get me wrong, but we're trying to then manage them. And it's a tough market and it's, a, it's, a, it's a very much about communication right through to the end user, through the build up from the supply chain from China. Okay, and in terms of um, your suite of projects, um, as we touched on earlier, um, Hanson Young can work on, you know, anything from defence to hotels, um, yep. prisons, um, you know, hospitals, the full gamut. Um, are there projects that have sort of proceeded largely untouched um, that have been sort of able to really persevere through this time? And then are there projects that have seen a lot of effect from the coronavirus outcomes? Um, the, the, the projects as I see them within our business here in Victoria are all affected uh, with external plannings. So uh, mainly windows. Um, we're getting our joinery manufactured locally, which uh, removes that particular risk from the business. Um, it's all glass and aluminium. Um, lifts not so much because we've already got the lifts out of Japan uh, on one particular project uh, and so they're not coming from China um, so that particular uh, conduit of product uh, is, is already in Australia uh, and about to commence on one of the on one of the projects down here in St Kilda so um, yeah I haven't seen a big effect in our business but I understand that others in the uh, in the building industry have had more significant effect on their businesses. Yeah, that's right. And I guess it's all about timing. What stage of project, uh, you know, of the project process you're in. Um, you've mentioned you had already, um, you know, let a number of packages and orders. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure those who were sort of um, letting and uh, around the March period would have seen a. A significant impact. Um, what's been interesting for as um, for any Australian has been the co cooperation we've seen at government level, uh, the forming of a national cabinet, um, combining um, federal and state ministers, Labor or, or Liberal, all sort of working um, or coalition working um, in the one tent, which I think a lot of people have been glad to see. Um, we also understand that we've seen this um, within the construction sector as well, with uh, unions, government um, and contractors coming together, pulling together um, and appreciating that this is a shared, um, a shared challenge um, and not one to be borne by a single party. Um, what sort of activity have you seen um, in that response and um, do you think that's been a, a, a positive outcome? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, knowing that uh, the, the government here in Victoria have recognised that the building industry provides 
Uh, for every job in the building industry, it supplies about four and a half jobs for every job on a building site. So that's quite significant in the in the supply chain locally into the industry. So if we can keep the industry open, uh, pouring concrete, putting kitchens in, putting uh, uh, finishing buildings, we see that it provides a continuity within. Uh, the uh, workforce and therefore uh, money flowing through the taxation system. What the building industry um, groups recognised that there was significant risk if the building industry was shut down with the amount of uh, jobs that were affected by that. So the coming together of, of uh, government, uh, union representative bodies, and then employ your representative bodies throughout the building industry has been a great thing. Uh, we've seen uh, open uh, communication between each of the representative organizations and the umbrella groups to actually drive some of these significant outcomes, which is cooperation, keeping sites open, um, uh, driving the positivity around how we manage this particular thing on sites, how do we continue to uh, work with the with the works out here in Victoria and government to make sure that we recognise what the risks are and then manage those risk profiles in a way that either we have social distancing within uh, meetings on site, pre-start meetings, how do we uh, manage sites, lunchroom areas, um, etc. Mm. to keep to keep people working. Absolutely. And to keep people working safely is, an, is another thing. So whether it's the, it's the um, it's, uh, uh, lunch rooms, two people per, um, so one person for every four square meters in a lunch room, which now means that the lunch rooms are now four times the size that they used to be. Yeah. Uh, vertical hoisting of people within very high-rise uh, buildings. We notice here in the, in the city that uh, the high-rise buildings have a particular bottleneck with um, getting people to a work face. Uh, that is uh, absolutely significant. And the Melbourne City Council, recognising that as an issue, uh, basically relaxed the start times uh, with government and in cooperation to basically uh, uh, lengthen the work day or make it, you can start at six o'clock. So the vertical transporting of, of uh, workers to work phase is then facilitated by government and by the local uh, authorities. So it, we've never seen this before in the in industry. And I think it's a great thing because we all recognize that we have to play our part. No. I suppose uh, my question would be in consideration for these uh, isolation measures or the social distancing part is how construction management, clean with the CIOB and the younger professionals entering industry that are now being thrown a hell of a lot of uh, responsibility all of a sudden, uh, being supported and helping them to cope with it in a, in a Obviously, it's an ever-changing environment for everybody. But for the younger folk, I was sort of expecting a sort of gradual uh, supportive role in, and now they're thrown at the, the face of it, and off you go. Uh, well, I've seen in our business, I can't talk about other people's businesses, I know that we have done a lot of uh, inductions within the, 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 the documentation that comes out of government or the documentation that comes through our corporate um, leadership to uh, then filter that down onto sites and what it means to the project team on each individual site. And it's not always just left to the younger people on site. Yeah. I have a big issue about bringing people with us so everybody within a team becomes part of the success of that particular team. So whether it's inductions, whether it's speaking to people out on site, whether it's looking at people in Alimax, whether it's looking at people installing precast panels, whether it's a concrete crew, just pulling people and actually saying to them, we have signed up to this 
particular delivery method, which is social distancing. What does it mean for you? Do you understand what it means? This is what the government are actually requiring us to do. And if we don't do it, then your job's at risk, my job's at risk. So let's all work together. Uh, but as you say, younger people, um, we really do have to support uh, our younger members of our teams, the, uh, the people that you have as your young professionals and I have as my younger staff to uh, make sure that everybody plays a part. It's not just we expect them, as you say, to throw them into the deep end. It's about supporting people to get the best outcomes for the business. At the end of the day, we as a business have to make sure that the, every member of the team uh, comes on the journey with us. It's about education, exposure to the issues, discussing them in the team meetings, and then carrying out those particular issues on the site. Um, not just through documentation, but it's through conversations, you know. We get the best out of it by having a conversation on the site, out on the concrete slab, in the dust, with the noise, or on the scaffold, to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I think it's... I suppose uh, that, that, that's a beauty to the, the situation at present. There is a silver lining um, going forwards, or we can have some of these takeaways uh, transition into the new sort of... Uh, operations that we're going to actually see on site or what have you. What do you see as positive learning lessons that we can take away from this? I know this morning Sarah Barker out of Minter Ellison's was saying that corporate corporate strategy may now align further towards um, aligning with the Paris Climate Agreements and that sort of thing to transition us, I suppose, to tackle some of the other uh, dilemmas, I suppose, that were facing the planet beforehand, and uh, that may be brought on board to assist uh, us in the future? Yeah, we've seen in the industry uh, the greater recognition within Australia and Australian buildings about new technologies, about air tightness, about lifting the standard to a new level and demanding that we uh, bring, take our buildings, make them more efficient and deliver more efficient buildings. Uh, we certainly see that um, more and more, not building in the same way that we used to, uh, you know, uh, whether it's the, the living standard or it's the, uh, the green star standards, uh, you know, we're certainly seeing a lot more of that. I can't talk more globally about what we see in the future. I mean, I can talk personally about what I would like to see, and I would certainly like to see a more efficient industry um, uh, to allay any of those, uh, you know, ongoing issues that this particular uh, uh, lockdown, the virus itself, and what it's making us do is to look more globally about what we have. You know, we look at the satellite images and we see less pollution, for instance. Uh, we see... Uh, how are we going to respond to that? How is industry going to respond to that? How are we going to work more from home? Are we going to see people working, uh, 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 instead of having more flexible workplaces, have them even tighten again uh, to have a lot more flexibility? And whether, you, whether it's Microsoft Teams or it's Zoom or it's, you know, working, we do miss, and I see it within our business too, people miss that collegiate coming together within an office environment around the water cooler or around the coffee machine or in, you know, just getting people together. How do we maintain that by uh, having people working remotely? That's a, a significant issue for all businesses. Uh, I think if you say the legal businesses, accountants, uh, lawyers, uh, building industry, uh, how do you get your design team to work more uh, you know, we've seen a few issues in that with how do you get an architecture practice that's running a Revit model uh, to be able to manage and manipulate that model and a couple of people working on it. Have they got the bandwidth? Have they got the capability from home? Uh, do they live in an area that's got uh, quality uh, internet service? You know, all of that sort of stuff. Yes, we're building the NBN, but is it getting rolled out quick enough? to respond to this particular issue. And I think this has forced um, a, lot of, a lot of businesses to start walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Um, you talk about Revit, Brian, and, um, you know, BIM, um, you know, building information um, management and modelling. It's been talked about for so long now. The UK have, um, you know, 
enforced it on, on government projects and have talked about legislating it. In Australia, we're very, we tend to be very slow at, um, you know, taking on new technology that um, becomes the everyday in North America and the UK and Europe. Um, but I, I guess a lot of businesses in construction and outside construction have now been forced to say, well, you've been talking about going online, you've been talking about, you know, using um, the cloud and servers and, and BIM. Um, so, well, here's your opportunity um, and you don't really have another choice. So um, I think that's probably a positive as well. There's, it stopped the, the over-deliberation and, um, Yes. Too much debate around should we, shouldn't we, um, should we, shouldn't we, and I've just said, well, you've got no choice. You have to embrace these new technologies. Um, <laughs> there's there's no time for fear, and there's no there's no time for talk. It's time to walk the walk, and I think we'll also see some of those impacts um, trickle on 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 the um, focusing on the horizon and coming out of this um, this difficult time. Um, we know that uh, taking a local focus, we know that the Victorian government has set up their recovery task force um, that is overseen by the Treasurer and Minister for Planning. They're obviously having discussions around how they can kickstart the economy. Um, they're very interested in construction um, and, and development as they fully appreciate that, you know, construction is, is so important to Victoria's economy. Um, and we know that there's trickle-down effects um, as well from that being, you know, tradies buy meat pies. Um, you know, every, it's a bit of an everyone wins situation when you get more construction into the economy. Um, what, what sort of actions would you like to see, whether that's from Hanson Youngkin's point of view or your point of view, um, and suggestions to come out of that recovery task force. Yes, I feel uh, that the government's response will uh, be around social infrastructure. Uh, I think that they will need to look at uh, social housing was always a big issue within how do we respond to that? How do we build more of this? How do we build it effectively? Uh, government um, regional areas, um, around uh, provision of healthcare, hospitals, smaller centres, um, re uh, responding to the local areas in regional uh, towns like Shepparton, Aubrey, down the valley, um, and maybe over towards uh, Bendigo, Ballarat as well. There's hospital infrastructure that has to be delivered at, at, um, at Ballarat, um, and there's other extensions required up uh, Shepparton, um, Aubrey, Wodonga that is all part of being discussed in government at the moment. Uh, and I see that we would certainly be interested in following up more of this um, through having experience delivered into this um, hospitals, social infrastructure is part of what Hanson Young can do. So yeah. I, I see less of the, um, the more uh, developer-driven construction is all about confidence, and until confidence returns, I see that that's going to be a particular issue around are we going to have more high-rise apartments in the CBD? Are we going to have higher density? Is the more lower uh, risk, uh, lower value apartments in the inner and outer suburbs? Are they going to be the ones that are going to drive some of that uh, commercial um, uh, developer-led construction? Um, it may. Uh, are we going to have uh, uh, the levels of uh, pricing in houses uh, or apartments that we've had in the past? I, I think there's a lot of risks around uh, the future, and I think we're all trying to deal with them. But I think the government lead is, where, is what we're looking for. We're looking for government to provide a lead and then uh, uh, confidence will come with the government lead and then with the levels of cooperation that the industry organisations, both the unions, government, uh, and employer groups will have. I think that that's going to be a, a, a real positive for the industry going forward because I think people will now recognise that the, the, that the high levels of cooperation and problem solving are going to drive the economy. Um, and I think the economy within the building industry. 
think it's a really interesting point that you bring up, Brian, that um, the government might have to set the scene um, and increase confidence in building in Victoria um, and encourage developers to come back to town, so to speak. And the best way to do that is through government um, government funded and government led projects. So I think that's a really interesting point that um, they'll have to inject confidence back into uh, Victorian construction and development sector. And I mean, working in social housing myself, you know, we have 86,000 individuals on the Victorian housing register. So there's absolutely, um, there's a demand there. And, and with, um, you know, with immigration to f- fall significantly this year compared to other years, given the uh, flight restrictions, um, you know, and population growth to come to a close to a halt. Um, the demand for all those apartments and, um, you know, those one bedders, two bedders and all that sort of thing, my opinion is that'll dwindle. Um, but we've mm-hmm. got a demand of 86,000 that we can tap yes. into. So uh, we'd be crazy yes. not to. And granted, um, they're family units, so they're not all individuals. But, I mean, that's a no. big list of, um, you know, of renters. Um, yes. They're ready to go that the government should support. So yeah. I fully agree with you that social infrastructure is going to be massive coming out of this. Yeah, I think that also um, looking to get uh, building companies interested in providing that level of uh, integration with, and our social conscience, you know, our social conscience may need us to uh, see this sort of this sort of need, need with government and how do we come together to make it work, either to provide jobs in regional Victoria, to, to then drive uh, more of this social housing. Because social housing is not just a Melbourne CBD issue. It's, a, it's an issue throughout the state. And we do have to, as a business and as, a, as a, uh, the citizens of the state, really focus on these particular outcomes that are, are absolutely necessary. You know, we shouldn't be a first world country and have this level of, um, of uh, disconnect in our uh, housing and, and housing those in need because housing needs to be supported by all sorts of other government uh, services and how do we build communities that can get that support. Absolutely. And you mentioned social conscious and I think um, given that so many Australians who weren't on Newstar now referred to as job seeker um, and were on no sort of welfare payment, and perhaps um, stigmatise, added to the stigma around those on welfare payments, all, all of a sudden found themselves on the exact same, in the exact same arrangement. So yeah. I think, um, I hope we shed a lot of that stigma because um, a lot of us have realised that, um, you know, on, on, the, on the back of a dime, we can all end up in, in the same situation. Um, yeah. It just takes a certain, certain market conditions and... Um, yeah. All, all of a sudden you're on welfare payments too. So it, it sort of forces us to um, get off our high horse a bit and understand that um, we're all, you know, we're all, um, no one's um, invincible and um, no one's immune to, uh, to those challenges. Um, so we might, we might wrap up here. Um, Brian, not sure if you wanted to um, have any final comments about Hanson Youngkin Um and uh, sort of, you know, your um, what you see coming going forward, um, and you know what what's on the horizon for you guys. Um, I just see uh, a, uh, a new procedure within our business, just recognising supply chain, where are items coming from. Uh, what is the risk associated with that particular uh, item of plant or equipment and what is plan B? Um, Working with clients at a very early stage in the procurement process or during the procurement of uh, trade packages, uh, we've recognised that in a business we want to bring and we have brought our clients along the journey with us. Um, more about where it comes from and how are we going to ensure that that particular item of plant or equipment actually gets here when it's required. There may be, have to be some relaxation or re-looking at uh, building contracts 
to recognize that if a certain uh, items, should we be storing them here? Should we get them early, store them in country so that we can then uh, take from a stock, not just in time delivery, as we have been practicing for the last 25, 30 years, do we have to start thinking outside the square again? Does the, does the contracting model have to alter slightly? Do we have to be um, uh, in a less adversarial relationship uh, with, with our clients insofar as the rigidity of, of, of agreements are? Yes, you're tied to time and budget, but around this other stuff, do we have to come closer to people and recognize that, uh, as we have in the recent past, uh, sat down with our client and basically said, uh, with a delay in a project, yes, it's going to go ahead, but this particular element of plant needs to be ordered now. So a chilo from Europe was ordered early, it's on the water, it will be here in time. But if it was ordered uh, in March, as you pointed out earlier on, it wouldn't get here because the factories are shut. So it's about recognising what the risk is, recognising the management structure you put to manage those risks and how do you get your project delivered on time. And I think that we as a business will be looking at those particular schedules, uh, the project team looking at every item, whether it's uh, door hardware, sanitary wear, um, uh, pressured uh, vessels or pipe work or air conditioning equipment or it could be any number of things that if they come from overseas or they are at risk, recognizing it and planning around that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there's some great learnings um, for Hanson Yankin and, and and the broader um, the broader yeah. sector. We might wrap up there. Um, for those watching, thanks very much uh, for taking the time to watch our first episode in our Industry Insights series, uh, where we hope to give um, our members, sort of students, graduates and young professionals, but also anyone working or studying in the built environment, an insight into what's happening in our sector and some of the challenges we're all facing and also some of the successes that we're, we're enjoying. Um, I've been here with... Uh, our Vice, Novus Victoria Vice Chair, Conrad Piera. Thanks, Conrad. And, of course, a massive thank you to Brian McAdam from Hanson Yunkin uh, for your time this morning. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed the questions. I uh, enjoyed the discourse and I enjoyed uh, the preparation and uh, planning and discussing the particular issues in the industry with other professionals who are... Uh, who are in the same boat and very happy to share um, experience and uh, insights. Uh, so very, very thank you, very much heartfelt thank you to you and the team uh, at Novus and uh, very happy to participate. Thank you again. Thanks very much, Brian. And, and we wish Hanson Young and all the best through this period and going into the second half of 2020.